So I'm Lior, if we haven't met yet. Uh, nice meeting you. I've been reading your assignments and greatly enjoying them. Um, all good. And uh, we're going to be talking about another project from our lab today. Uh, just to like put things into perspective and in context, we're not just you know, out of the blue inserting uh, two lectures, two guest lectures from the lab uh, into this course. It's important for us, for you to also see how we actually use the things we talk about in the course in our daily lives, in our daily uh, work. Uh, and um, we hope that you can appreciate it together with us, how these can be used together. If you have any questions throughout, it's like a PI free zone here today. Feel free to interrupt, ask whatever you want. I'd be more than happy to discuss it. Uh, and some of the work we're going to uh, talk about here is also still unpublished. So if there's anything that like, you're particular, particularly excited about, we can talk about that more and I don't know, maybe collaborate. And uh, amazing science will come out of this lecture today. I'm very optimistic this morning. So let's start. Has anyone seen this before? No? No? Maybe I'm too old for this course. I've been, uh, you know, uh, it's been uh, an interesting uh, few months. And uh, we've been, uh, some of us have been spending some time on social media. And I saw this image a bunch of times. And uh, I don't know, it makes me feel uh, like happy and optimistic. It seems like nature is everywhere, right? And if, for those of you who came in a few minutes ago, you also saw this video I put in before from uh, David Attenborough's Our Planet. It's on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, you should really watch it. And I feel like images like this, they somewhat uh, distort our image, our perception of uh, reality. Because if I look at these images, or maybe watch National Geographic or David Attenborough shows, they can make me feel like you know, nature is doing really well somewhere away from my house because I live in an urban environment, but I don't know, somewhere in the, the jungles or somewhere in uh, South uh, Asia or Africa or far away from me, wildlife is doing very, very well. So that's one thing I can feel. And the other thing I can feel is that you know, we know that there's climate change and all these horrible things coming about. And uh, you know, nature is probably doing horribly, and nature is going to be gone very, very soon. And these are all very qualitative ideas that are also not very helpful. There is not much I can do with these qualitative notions. So far, so good. So what would the suggested solution be for you? Like, What would you advise me to do if I don't want to have this qualitative perception of the world? Thank you. So instead of using this really um, uh, somewhat binary qualitative notions. I don't want to have uh, like these images in my mind. I want to quantify wildlife. I, have to, I want to have a better quantitative perspective. If I have a better quantitative perspective, I can also see how things change over time. So I don't know, maybe I can like, um, imagine a scenario in which someone uh, woke up in the year uh, 2100 and uh, said, oh, there are only 10 deer in the world. And their neighbor would tell them, you know, there, there were always just 10 deer in the world. It's fine. So if we do have some sort of quantitative perspective now, maybe we can have a better understanding of what's going to happen in the future, what happened in the past. And no one can convince us that, uh, you know, things have never changed. Or there's this phenomenon called shifting baselines that I'm sure many of you have heard of, right? We can just say, ah, there has always been just 10. And in many cases, this is not the case. Is that clear? Yeah, OK. Just feel free to stop me at any point. So I want to talk about the global biomass of wild mammals. You've probably, you've probably seen the, the first slide. And uh, before I do, I really like this picture. It's a, it's a, it, in, it doesn't happen very often that you feel that like your science connects to real life. but. Uh, I think that a couple of days before I, I had to defend my master's thesis, which was uh, working on this project, I opened the weekend newspaper, and there was this picture of these two rhinoceros, uh, female rhinoceros. And I was really excited. You know, I'm working on quantifying mammal biomass. And really, during that weekend, uh, it was like the hardest uh, weekend, uh, Musaf, if any of you read it, 
and um, they had, had like a four or six page long spread about these two female rhinoceros. They're like the, the two uh, last ones of their species and they're both female. So we know that subspecies is going to go extinct. Obviously two females, uh, there's not much future there. And I feel like that really exemplifies the motivation that wild mammals uh, provide for people. Because I can't really imagine a similar spread being done about the two less you know, insects of their kind, or uh, the two less bacteria of their kind, or anything like that. So really, people are motivated by mammals. They care about them. And that's one of the reasons we think it's very important to go about and quantify them specifically even though it's also, of course, very important to quantify pretty much everything we can. But allow me to speak from uh, my own perspective. So why quantify the global biomass of wild mammals? It's a means to encourage conservation efforts. We didn't come up with this idea. Organizations like the WWF, the IUCN Red List, they all have mammals on their logo. People care about mammals. They're motivated by them. So it's really a means to keep people engaged. And it's a way to provide a baseline for global and historic, uh, historic biomass estimates. So if we, know, if we don't know where we are now, we don't know how to compare to where we were, I don't know, maybe two centuries ago or what, to what will happen in the future. So we need to have some sort of stock estimate to what we have now first. So far, so clear? Yeah, OK. So uh, the question. I, I hope on everyone, everyone's mind is uh, why biomass? So we want to quantify the global biomass of mammals. So why biomass? People often talk about things like biodiversity or species richness, if you'd like. And these metrics are very, very important. But uh, does anyone know what biodiversity means? By a show of hands, anyone? Yeah. So. OK, number of species. Anyone else? Other answers? OK, so biodiversity, it's, not, it's a difficult question. Biodiversity is a very broad term. It can comprise a lot of things inside of it. One of these matrix inside biodiversity is, is the number of species, species, which is we call it species richness. So basically, how many species we have? I know, how many species do we have in this room? One. OK, we can also think about the bacteria in our gut, but uh, we don't have to. You got, you got my point. So that's, uh, that's one way to look at it. There are also multiple other ways to look at uh, biodiversity, which also includes some sort of a uh, matrix for abundance. They're all very, very uh, non-intuitive. Also, for species richness, uh, I would argue that for mammals, it's a matrix that is uh, very hard to use on in global. It's very uh, misleading to use in global terms. Why is it misleading? So what if I told you that in recent years, we've only added species of uh, wild mammals to the list of species we know? We're just adding new species to the list in recent years. That sounds like good news, right? We're discovering new species. Everyone's looking at me very skeptically, but to me, it sounds like very good news. Um, but then I can tell you that the reason that we're adding new species to the list is because of taxonomic redefinitions. So we can have one species, and uh, its uh, range was split into two, and some sort of uh, like uh, uh, they, they evolved in a specific way, or they have a specific other specific uh, uh, external uh, know, things that are different, like a, a black nose or a white nose, or uh, things along these lines. And now we can say that these are not two, uh, not a uh, subspecies, but they're two uh, distinct species. So this is great. It doesn't necessarily tell me anything about how well the species is doing, right? Maybe if I'm an expert, I can gain something from it. But if I told you now there are instead of 6,400 species, 6,500 species to a lay person, it sounds like good news. And I consider myself, myself a lay person in those terms. So let's not use species richness. Another thing, is we, another thing we could use is the number of individuals. So how many rabbits are there? How many elephants are there? It's a very interesting matrix. Uh, I find it very interesting. But it's very, um, it's very complicated to assess. So there are a lot of things like, uh, uh, that, that go into that. And also, one could argue that the contribution of each of these species, it's uncomparable. Or you can't compare the, um, 
not the contribution, it's not the right word, but you can compare you know, the effect that a single rabbit had, has on its environment to that of an elephant. They're on completely different scales. If I would, were to, stood in the, or to stand in the jungle and a rabbit passed by, maybe I wouldn't even notice it. If an elephant passes by, I would have noticed it, uh, noticed it and it really uh, has an effect on the, um, not on, on what I see in my eyes, but on other things as well. So I can't really um, compare these two species. So that's exactly what biomass comes to solve. It allows me to put everything on one scale. So biomass is, for us now, it, it will be the total mass of a species or a group. And uh, it allows me to compare species with very, very different body masses. So far, clear? Yeah, questions, that's exciting, yeah. Uh, would you say that to appropriate biomass of a certain species, like, is there like a rule of thumb that a certain amount of biomass means that the species in general consider living habitats succeeding? Like, is a certain biomass of species that are above the endangered species line the same as the same that are below the species? So you're kind of asking, let me see if I got your question, as he's kind of asking, now that I know that the biomass of a species is X, what can I learn from it, right? Can I learn that it's doing well, it's not doing well? So let's dive into that in like when, when we get to, we have a slide basically on that, so let's wait uh, for a second. If uh, I don't get to it by the end of this hour, let me know. Other questions? I, I'm not convinced how biomass is a good metric, because for instance, there can be like 10,000 small biomass species, and they're all So that's an excellent question. I will say that we don't treat biomass as the only matrix. We use it as a complementary matrix. So for us, it does not replace other matrix as well, but it gives us some sort of indication to how well that species is doing. And I know you said that it's better to have 10,000 of one than 10 elephants, right? I'm not sure that's true. We think it's an additional perspective to uh, see how well things are doing, uh, to see where they stand, and um, it definitely does not replace other, other metrics as well. So this is the focus of, of our work, but yeah. Okay. Other questions? So let's dive in. So the, the units we're going to use are units of one megaton or megaton. So it's a very large number, kind of hard to imagine. So a megaton is one million metric ton, 10 to the nine kilograms. We're talking in units of wet mass. So kind of like the units we see on the scale when we stand on the scale, not a, we don't have to dry anyone out before we put them on the scale. And uh, if, uh, if this number is, you know, we, we talked about the fact that the large numbers are very hard to imagine. So I like to imagine a cube that's 100 meters tall, 100 meters wide, and 100 meters long. If I took this cube and I filled it with water, it would weigh one megaton. OK, so just like let's try using this yardstick, for example, uh, and uh, thinking about this thing of a biomass, for the, maybe for the first time, um, with uh, humans. So I want to calculate the total biomass of humans on Earth. And uh, if I took an average human, they would weigh about 50 kilograms. <laughs> so I, I can see people are bothered by it. Yeah? There's Someone's... always more children, so it makes sense. So if you're bothered by it, you're completely right. Uh, you're probably thinking of an adult human. People are very often uh, bothered by it. But then we have to consider the fact that not only adult humans uh, roam this uh, planet, we also have a lot of children. Sorry? Most humans, yeah, most humans are I don't, I, I'm not sure I got your point. Oh, okay, maybe like the fraction of uh, children is the same as the fraction of overweight people and then they balance each other and most people are... Okay, so overweight. just uh, for now we can, we can take my word for it. We can... Weightless. Sorry, what so was that? That half of them are women. 
So, so we have to consider demographics. We have to consider it. Well, it's like it turned into a political discussion. But uh, <laughs> we have like women and children and men and some people who are overweight and some people who are underweight. And we got to this, uh, this number of 50 kilograms. Does anyone remember what these two tilde stand for? So we, it's, it's one way of approximating. What does one tilde stand for? Order of magnitude. So it's an order of magnitude here. It's like a factor of a few. So, and then if I want to calculate the total biomass of humans, I would have to multiply this by the number of people on this planet, 8 billion people, and then I would reach 400 megatons. Mm -hmm. So if I, <laughs> you approve? Great. So uh, if, you, if we had this uh, cube we talked about before, that's 100 over 100 over 100, it's filled with water, and then I want to, I have this huge set of scales, I, I, would, I can put all of humanity on one side, and then 400 of these cubes on the other side, these scales would balance, and I would be I don't know, happy. It's a, it's a weird situation to be in, but I would be happy. So we, we did this for humans. We calculated the total biomass of humans. And now I want to do the same for other mammals as well. And uh, this is where it becomes tricky, because uh, we don't have the same quality of data uh, for, for other species as we have for humans, right? If I now wanted to go about and uh, I'm disappointed by your reaction of this joke. But um, if I now wanted to go about and quantify the global biomass of all wildland mammals, let's say, I can't just go and collect you know, total population reports for each of these species because we don't have them. But when we set out to, go to do this project, we very naively believed that we would, find, we, we would find them for other species, even though they don't manage it themselves. We humanity, we know everything, we collect all of the data. And now we can see uh, what we have for all mammals. So Uri and Ayal are the heroes of this data collection. They sat down together and started collecting global population reports for all other uh, wild mammal species. We're talking about wild mammals for now. And uh, they sat down together and they found out that for uh, marine mammals, the job is pretty much done. Humanity has done a very good job of mapping the biomass of, uh, all, uh, sorry, of the abundance of all marine mammal species. So for species like blue whales, sperm whales, we know their abundance relatively well. Uh, you can see here that a third of the, for a third of the species, we don't have global population reports. But we can find a way to overcome it fairly easily. Some of them have partial population reports. For some of them, you know, no one has seen them in a very long time. So we can assume that their biomass is negligible. It's fairly easy to overcome. For wild land mammal species, this isn't the case. It's a lot more complicated. First, you can see that there are a lot more species of wild land mammals. So there are about uh, 6,400 uh, uh, species of wild land mammals. There are about only about 5,000 here, because for some of them, uh, we can assume as well that their biomass is negligible. But still, we could only attain uh, um, global abundance reports for about 10% of them. So we had to somehow overcome this. Does anyone have any idea how can we do that? Extrapolation. Yes, thank you for asking. So I was asked, what is this slide? Let me repeat. So we sat down to collect global abundance reports for each of the wild uh, mammal species that we know. Like, we, we, we know who these species are. We now want to know what their abundance is. So like we know for humans, there are 8 billion humans. Now I want to know what the abundance is for each of these species. So for about 120 marine mammal species, we know their abundances relatively well. For about 5,000 land mammal species, we know their global abundances only for about 10% of these species. So for the remaining species, everything in gray here, we have to come up with a way to estimate their biomass or their global abundance. Solution? OK, so. But that's like two steps ahead, right? 
that's two steps ahead. You're completely right. It's a, it's a valid, valid question. But uh, first, we have to like, come up with this idea of uh, um, you know, come up, coming up with some sort of model to see if, uh, to estimate the biomass of the remaining species using the species that we do have a representation for. And then we have to check if our model has some sort of bias, if our data has some biases, etc. Is the idea clear? That's an, that's an excellent idea. You're kind of saying, if we know that these, this species eats this species, so we kind of uh, can learn the dynamics from that, uh, that would be very complicated because you know, the world doesn't uh, exist on uh, mammals alone. We also have a lot of other animals. We have plants. We have a lot of moving parts. And also, what we're trying to create for now is some sort of snapshot. What do we have at this point? So basically, what we did was to say, OK, we have global population reports for about 400 species. We have for these species and for other species as well, for which we want to know their global abundance. We have rain size, body mass, and other so sort of species-specific uh, properties. And now we want to find a model that can uh, take us from point A to point C. We want to find uh, uh, somehow to get there. <laughs> rain size is the size of the like the, the, the geographical size of the area you reside on. So I don't know, if uh, someone's never left Israel, their rain size would be Israel. Would be the size of Israel, sorry. But it's a, it's a great question. So we want to get from uh, point A to point C here. And like, I've, like we've been told, we can just use a model to do it. So, I'm not, I'm, okay. so it's, I will say that it's something that uh, ecologists have been doing for a lot, a lot, a lot of years. They've said, let's say you know, we've had this uh, small rodent uh, that has a body size of uh, I don't know, half a kilogram. And there is another small rodent that has a similar, uh, similar uh, species-specific property, but we don't know its density. So they use the, usually a linear model in power law to come up with some sort of uh, way to estimate its density as well. We kind of did the same. However, we didn't use a linear model. We used a machine learning <coughs> model, so we support vector, vector regression. It's a classical machine learning model that people have been using since the 80s. It worked better for us than the linear model. Uh, and then we used the support vector regression to infer the global population and to estimate the total biomass of these species. And then, of course, we do have to examine, examine all of the biases that we have in our data set. Um, I don't really want to go into that because it's not interesting for everyone. But if anyone's interested in that, I'll be more than happy to talk about that. Or you, know, you can read the paper and we can talk about it. Or, so, but if anyone has a specific question about it, I'll be happy to answer it. No specific questions so far. OK. Yeah. I'm not sure I follow the. So do you mean characterized by I I know of the species or counted how many species are there? So it's not necessarily true. There are a lot of species that are you know highly charismatic, so we know their abundance fairly well, and also for many many years. Uh, there there are a lot of moving parts there. That's why I'm not getting into it. But we definitely did our best to make sure there is a fair representation across our species. I will say that you know, your intuition is correct in the sense that people don't go and count uh, things that are very, very abundant and that they consider pests. Like No one went and counted all of the squirrels in the world. So we have to come up with a way to, come up, uh, to compensate for that. On the other hand, sometimes people do count the things that are considered pests because they like hunting them. So, Let's say for, the, for some species in North America, there is a, a fairly abundant, uh, <laughs> abundant uh, data for their, their global population, their population in North America, just because they're game animals. Other questions? OK. So yeah. Do you have the body mass of all these mammals? Yeah, we do. We have the body mass of okay. all these mammals. And 
just going back here, for all the species, we have brain size, body mass, and other properties as well, like uh, how endangered that they are according to the IUCN red list and other properties. Yeah. yeah. So just don't let the support vector aggression uh, part of the question uh, part of the uh, graph confuse you. You can just imagine in your mind these linear models that we've known since we were very young, right? We have uh, like a, a y-axis and an x-axis and a cloud of dots, and we just uh, put in like a regression line. We're very uh, confident in doing that usually, sometimes overconfident in doing that. Just that this time the model isn't linear and it has other properties that allows us to do this uh, regression. Yeah, just, just so I get it straight, you have 4,800 species that are missing? No, so have we have 4,400 species for which we don't have global population reports. Ah, but for, for those, you have 4,800 that you do have range size, body mass, and IUCN. So we have a total of uh, 4,800 species, out of which for 400, we do have global population reports. And the rest, you have range size, body mass, and IUCN. Like and uh, many other species, many other species-specific species -specific properties. Okay, but it has to have like yes and like it can't. You have to have all those pieces of information in order to. Yeah, but we do have. So luckily for mammals, you know, people have been researching them for a very long. They're similar to us. There aren't that much. Uh, there's many many mammal species. So, it's um, so the the data on the, like their species specific properties is fairly abundant. Okay. So I think we'll dive into the fun parts of uh, the fun part of uh, this part of the conversation. So the results, what's the global biomass of uh, wild mammals? And uh, if you were here last time, this was our teaser. So if we took the combined weight of all wildland mammals, what are wildland mammals again? They're giraffes and elephants and all these species that are wild, so not us, not cows, and also not whales, because these are not land mammals. Um, and we divided it equally between all of the people on Earth. What would each person get? So let's vote one more time, if you don't mind. Would it be something along the lines of hundreds of grams or a squirrel? Would it be something along the lines of a rabbit, a deer, or a few tens of kilograms, or a rhinoceros, a few hundred kilograms? So by a show of hands, a few hundred grams, A, eh? anyone? Only land, right? Not sea. Land, wild land mammals. Good question. OK, we have about 10 for a while. You came in less optimistic this time than you were last time. How about a few kilograms, anyone? We have about 15 as well. A few tens of kilograms. We have, OK, it's an interesting idea. Maybe we have some revoting. And a D, anyone? A rhinoceros? We have one for a rhinoceros. OK. So um, first of all, it's interesting that you had this, uh, this intuition, and I'm, I'm happy that you voted. Uh, but the answer is B. It's a few kilograms. So if we took a resolve, and we put all of the wild terrestrial mammals on, uh, on one set of scales and all wild marine uh, mammals on the other set of scales, we would get about 20 million tons for all wild terrestrial mammals and about 40 million tons for all wild marine mammals. So if I took the total biomass of wildland mammals and divided it equally between all of you, everyone would get a rabbit to take home, not an elephant, not a rhinoceros, a rabbit. <laughs> You're not getting rabbits at the end of this lecture. <laughs> so I have another question to ask you. Since we have these results, now we can ask which phylogenetic order contributes most to the global biomass of wildland mammals? If you don't know what a phylogenetic order is, you can just erase these words and think of it as group. It's just a group of uh, genetically similar species. And uh, I'm going to ask you whether these are even hoofed mammals, bats, elephants, or rodents. If you don't know what even hoofed mammals are, if that's the argument that's going on there, let me solve it for you. In terms of biomass, they're mostly deer and boar species. So which group contributes most? Is it A, even hoofed mammals? OK. What about bats? We have two for bats. Elephants? Two for elephants. Rodents? Wow, we have a lot of people for rodents. 
can anyone vo uh, who voted for rodents tell me what the what the species he had in mind was? Rats. Okay. So before before we talk about that, uh, these are our results. So the size of the of the animal is representative of its fraction of the biomass, and you can also see here just uh, in terms of our results in terms of number of species, number of individuals, and biomass. So this bar here is very similar to what you see with the size of the animals. It's just another way to represent it. Um, and this goes back again to the fact that we care about all of these types of matrix. This is just our, uh, uh, our new perspective. And uh, we can see that even hoofed mammals are about half of the total biomass of wild land mammals. I think for us in Israel, it might be more surprising than for people in other places, unless you're from Haifa, and then you're not as surprised. Uh, that's usually the, the answer I get. Uh, I will say that uh, we don't consider rats uh, wild land mammals. So for two species of rats and a species of uh, um, house mice that we sometimes have, these are synanthropic species, so they're species that we that are very associated with humans. They live in our homes, in our sewage systems. If we're unlucky, they live very near us. So they're not domesticated, but they're also not really wild. It's this uh, not very binary definition that we had to work with. So for the purposes of this analysis, we remove them from, uh, uh, from this category. We do have back-of-the-envelope estimates for their biomass. Okay, so next question in line. Which species contribute, contributes most to the total biomass of wildland mammals? We're talking about wildland mammals there. So is it the eastern gray kangaroo, the African savanna elephant, the capybara, or the white-tailed deer? We'll do it by a show of hands once more. So anyone for the eastern gray kangaroo? We have one. For the African savanna elephant, we have one. Interesting, for the capybara, <laughs> we have five. And for the white-tailed deer, wow, so many people for the, for the white-tailed deer. Oops. You were right. We saw the last slide. You saw the last, but that was a, a deer, a deer, not the white-tailed deer. Never mind, wow. okay. <laughs> but, but, but now I'm, I'm, happy to, <coughs> I'm happy to know that, that the, the previous image is telling. But you were right. Uh, so the, the number one top contributor, according to our estimate, is the white-tailed deer. Uh, I will say that usually for people who are, I know, not a, not northern North American, this is very surprising to me. That was very surprising. And then um, we speak to North Americans who are, you know, from the East Coast, and they're like, yeah, we we know we know the species very well. So for us, the fact that we go out of our houses and we we don't see the species, it doesn't mean anything. Again, we go back to these uh, qualitative notions. So we also have here the wild, uh, the wild boar and the African elephant. The African elephant, mostly because of its size, and the wild boar, a lot because of its abundance. So 40% of the global biomass of wild land mammals is concentrated in just 10 species. Which kind of brings me back to the question Erez asked before. So what, what can we do with this biomass? Do we know that something is doing extremely well or extremely poorly? So we can't just determine how well a species is doing based on their biomass. There are a lot of uh, um, moving parts here, usually to uh, give a species some sort of category. So is it like doing well? Is it endangered? Is it critically endangered? We also look at the dynamics in time. Biomass is not enough, but I think it definitely tells us the story of what the world looks like now. So if I could like uh, clap my hands and make 10 species disappear, I would just eradicate about half of the global biomass of wild land mammals. So it's kind of an interesting story about how some species are extremely dominant and other species, maybe they're dominant in some small niche somewhere, but they're not dominant globally at all. This is another way of, you had a question, yeah? What about giraffes? <laughs> so uh, how many giraffes do you think there are? Few Does anyone have a guess? Like, was the elephant? 
So, so the, the answer is in the tens of th thousands. So let's say like the giraffes, uh, the, the amount of giraffes in the world is equivalent to the population of uh, like a Rehovot or something along these lines in terms of uh, like for the sake of the court. Um, but it's more than the elephant size. So there are about half a million uh, African elephants, uh, which you might find surprising. Um, so again, again, it's very hard to it's very hard to assess how well a species is doing just based on based on its biomass. So we know elephants are hunted, but they're also very well kept by humans. People have been trying to keep them for a very long period of time. It's um, yeah, I can I can talk about about it much more, but I don't want to bore anyone. But I will say that these ten species are all land. Okay, thanks. They're all. Um, relatively large body and they're herbivores. So they have a lot in common. I didn't just like randomly put uh, these images to put on the scale, even though they're adorable. Uh, it's an elephant and a boar and there are a lot of deer species in this, uh, in this table of top 10, um, along with the uh, kangaroos, which is, I, I find surprising, but people who are from uh, Australia would, uh, I guess, not be as surprised. And the moose as well. So this is a visual representation of uh, the geographical distribution of biomass. I will say that it's very, very simplistic. It's based on this uh, kind of um, assumption that we know is not realistic. It's just for the sake of this visual representation that the biomass of each species it's, is spread equally across its entire range, which we know it's not, is not the case, right? If you look at the NOA, uh, the population of humans, we know we're not, not everyone stands in like one square uh, kilometer and the next person stands in, in their own square kilometer. But this is just a way to get some sort of indication of how the world looks like in terms of wildland mammal biomass. It's surprising that Africa is estimated with less than So it's about the same. With, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a... Um, ah, just North America. So again, the Americas... And Africa. So these are the two Americas combined. Is that what you find surprising? <laughs> yeah. So I think I think it's very helpful to have these numbers because we are used to thinking with these uh, like a very qualitative notion. It's much more helpful to have this uh, uh, numerical representation so we can understand how well the world is doing. Just for you to see, uh, I know the, to me, the interesting uh, part that always attracts the eye are these brown, uh, brown blobs on uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And these are all just the African elephants. So we know its range very well. We can plot very well uh, uh, where, where it's found. So that's why it's very, very dense in that sense. Um, we can also see here that, uh, I don't know, that the uh, eastern gray kangaroo we don't know where it is so well. We have this uh, line here in uh, Australia because we, we kind of just like uh, have a very rough plot of where it's at. So, okay, we'll have a few more minutes and then we'll take a break. So I just want to um, uh, just uh, go back to the complete picture. We talked about wild land mammals for a second here. We can also talk about wild marine mammals, but most people don't know the distinction between uh, different types of whales. So we'll dive into that in a second. But I also want to talk about domesticated mammals and other mammals, which are <coughs> mammals who are not wild and not domesticated, us, humans. So we want to see what this is like compared to you know, us and our domesticated mammals. So one last, you have a question? One last question before the break. I want to ask you which fraction of mammal biomass on Earth is human? So if we took all of the mammals on Earth, these four groups I talked about, how much of it would be humans? The question is unclear or, the, or you're trying to guess? You're thinking, okay, okay. Okay, so 5, 20, 40, or 80%. Let's do it by a show of hands. Is it 5%? We have a nice representation of 5%, 20%, ah, a lot of people for 20%, 40%, okay, 
about 15, 80%, one very pessimistic person. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So this is, this is what the uh, biomass of mammals look, looks like. So if you haven't seen this type of diagram before or don't remember it from Ron Sanders' lecture, it's what we call a Voronoi diagram. It's kind of like a pie chart, but now we have uh, two dimensions to play with. So you can see the small pieces as well, right, in the pie chart. When you have a very small sleeve there, it's very hard to see. And uh, the shape of the polygon doesn't matter, just like the fraction it takes up from the whole. So you can see here that about half or 40% of the global biomass of mammals comes from human alone. And domesticated mammals are also a very significant portion. So we can see how this is compared to wild terrestrial and wild marine mammals. So um, I wanted to ask you to guess, but I gave you the answer already. But this massive polygon here is cattle alone. And the other polygons are other uh, domesticated mammal species like sheep, goats, and uh, pigs, things we use for our benefit. Yeah, anyone has a question? Anyone have their... Yeah? It's not a hand? Okay. Uh, are house pits enough of a biomass to go between a polygon or are they irrelevant? So by house pets, you mean dogs and cats? Yeah. So we do have a... Well, for this image, they're combined together, but uh, yeah, we, we do have a, an estimate for uh, domesticated pets and uh, cats and dogs. So for dogs, we have a rough uh, estimate. And we estimate that their biomass, the biomass of dogs, the rough estimate was funny, I get it. Uh, it's an excellent thing. So the, the, we, we estimate that the total biomass of dogs is about the same as all wildland mammals combined. So about 20 megatons, that's for dogs alone. Um, and uh, yeah, I also have a hidden slide with all of these details. So if you want, we can uh, chat about it after. We had a, the video had a question. Yeah, I wanted to know uh, the the um, those mammals that you said that they are not are not quite domesticated, but are also not. So rats and mice, we we put them in inside this category of domesticated mammals. Their total con contribution is of a few megatons, but this is again a very very course estimate based on the data that we have, which is not very abundant. People don't tend to gather global abundance estimates for rats. I wanted to ask you about the population of the yeah, so um, thank you. It's a great question. You're, you're asking, how do I know I'm not making things up? Uh, do I have a way of performing a sanity check to see uh, whether these in things are comparable? So, so the, the answer is the, yes. It's very important to have a sanity check. So for example, for some of the species for which we have uh, estimates using our model, we, um, we can uh, conduct like a manual analysis and see for if, let's say, we have this estimate for the, uh, the common warthog, what we like to think about is the Pumbaa in The Lion King. So, uh, and now we want to see if this estimate makes sense. So what we can do is go to the literature and find a local, abundant, a local density and abundance measurements, so ones that were conducted in specific places, and we compa can compare these to the estimates by our model. And then we can only use them in a certain way, right? Because if someone went and collected data in the place that where, um, where these are most abundant, we can say, ah, they have to be exactly the same as the estimates by our model, but we can use that as a sanity check. Uh, we can also use previous estimates. So for example, for marine mammals, people have kind of tried to uh, estimate the global ab abundance before of all marine mammals combined. We can think about that. It's definitely a very important part of the process. Uh, talking about uh, sustainability and so on, did you also do it over time? Like, did you, do you have uh, all the data to compare and then to see how does it Thank you. This is my friend. I put him in the audience for a reason. It's a planted question. And we're going to get there in a second. Oh, yeah. But uh, thank you for asking. Yeah. So, talking about sanity checks, so suppose you take all, all the mammals of the earth, uh, put them together, fit them in a cube, uh, 
assume they have a density similar to water, like one kilogram per liter. So we say it's one thousand megatons per cubic feet. Turn into a cube, which is kilometer cube of water, like it's still less of a city. So again, we had these cubes before that were one megaton, and you're saying if I took 20 of these cubes and I put all of the wild, I, I guess it's, it's an interesting one sanity thousand, check one thousand of these cubes, I mean, for all mammals. So each one has a 100 meter length, right? So it's enough to put the 10 cubes uh, by 10 by 10. Yeah. You get a, a one cube, which is one kilometer. I, I get your point. I'm just not sure it's very helpful for a sanity check because I don't, I don't have a, like a very good intuition to tell you whether it should be the size of Rehovot or the size of Tel Aviv or the size of Manhattan. I, I, don't, I don't think any of us have like very good intuition for like taking everything combined and put... It's, it's kind of complicated. We tend to use something that is more... Like uh, our intuition can kind of debunk in some way. Otherwise, it's, it's not a very good sanity check. Well, it's an interesting thought experiment anyway. Just it's definitely know. an interesting thought experiment. Experiment, sorry. Okay. So the vector regression, which you did for white uh, demonstrated for animals, it doesn't work for domesticated mammals. So for domesticated mammals, we have very abundant data. Um, we, d we didn't apply it for them, but also it's, you know, we know it's a, a very different uh, kind of uh, system, very different rules. That's also one of the reasons that uh, rats and mice were uh, outside this equation. So I want to move on to the break. So just before we do, I want to show you this uh, representation of uh, uh, the, the work that uh, someone in, in this classroom did, Itai, back there, uh, who is from uh, the graphics unit and worked with us to create this representation of our work. And now we know that only a few percent of, uh, of uh, the total uh, weight of mammals on Earth uh, comes from uh, wild uh, mammals. And then the question on our mind is, how did we get here? So we have this snapshot of what the world looks like in 2020, 2023. And now I want to know what the world was like and when my uh, great great grandma was born. Was it the same? Was it very different? So, kind of uh, like the, my way of phrasing this question in a more quantitative way is what was the ratio in 1850? Ooh. Okay, so I'll leave you to break before, uh, before we move on to the, to the answer. So, 15 minutes, and we'll be back here, and there's a short uh, second part. So uh, for the, the first hour, we talked about the global biomass of uh, wild mammals and also mammals generally. Now, what do we have now? And we got this nice illustration of kind of what we have for the year 2020, 2023. And now the question on my mind was, but what do we know about the past? Like, how has this changed over the past 170 years? And uh, just to like clarify things even further, if they're not clear, if before I could just multiply the mean uh, body mass of a person with a global population of the world, now I need these two for every time point that, uh, let's say for 170 time points over 170 years. So what was the population in 1850? Uh, what is it today? And the same for the mean body mass of a person. Does anyone know what the global population was in 1850? Five million. Less. Two billion. So, so, uh, so a lot of things around a billion, and the, the, that's correct. So it's about 1.2 billion. So the, the crossing point for to like a billion was about 1,800. So uh, uh, good job. So we already know that humans grew, the, the human population grew immensely during this uh, period of time. Right, we're, we're very thankful we're here <laughs> probably because of that. So, uh, so we already kind of know this part of the, of the riddle. Did anyone have a question? No. Okay. So just fairly easily multiplying these two numbers for every time point, we can have an estimate for the human biomass uh, over the past 170 years. Sorry, it's not as a... Uh, pretty as previous graphs, but you can just see that it looks kind of like 
uh, what you would expect that the uh, global population expanding rapidly, that means the biomass is, is uh, growing rapidly as well. So I did leave the... So it's uh, the confidence interval that's based on the uncertainty that comes from the, uh, like our uncertainty in the size of the global population. Yeah, excellent question. So, yeah. Just out of curiosity, um, the ratio of Elderly to young people nowadays is very different to what it was in 1860. Does that did that change your calculation? By yeah. So two or? so that's a. I put this question in the audience as well. Um, so so the mean body mass of a person probably changed somewhat during this period of time, right? So for, the one thing is the ratio of uh, adults to non-adults in the population. So the the population is probably older now than it was before. And also, uh, people are fatter than they were before. We eat more. Uh, we, we have the opportunity to consume all these uh, wonderful things. So we're fatter in term. We have some sort of a sensitivity analysis to see how this has changed over time using demographic data. So kind of like the age structure in the population and also the, um, the, the maximal height. So from height, we can reconstruct uh, uh, to weight using BMI. I don't really want to go into that because it's really, really boring. I just wanted to tell you that we have this sensitivity analysis. It doesn't change dramatically over time. So if you compare this to the fact that, uh, you know, the human population grew sevenfold over 170 years, we can, we, we can use this data, but this does not tell the majority of the story. The ma majority of the story comes just from uh, human expansion, human population expansion. Yeah, I just, I don't want to confuse everyone, so. Uh, yeah, and here we only uh, looked at till 1975, where we are still in like a very high increase rate of population. So, so it's not population, it's mean body mass? Right, but uh, in, a, in a net increase in So you're saying if I were to go further back in time to 1850, maybe uh, the increase would be very dramatical? Yeah. Because if I were to assume that this changes linearly in time from 1850, then the mean body mass of a human would be very small. So I don't have this, will be very, yeah, very light. So I don't have this slide over here, but I can tell you that this is very, very unlikely. We don't have as fine of resolution uh, uh, for the demographics data at each time point. That's why I don't have this in this figure here. But we can kind of assume that the global, uh, the global, the mean body mass of uh, like the average human was never less than uh, like 20 kilograms or something along these lines. So you're right in being skeptical. I can tell you that we've tested it and it's still uh, not very significant in telling the story. It is, it might be like a 10 or 20% more than what you would expect based on this uh, figure alone. So just to repeat the question to make sure uh, that I understood you correctly, you're saying that now we have more children than we had in the past? Yes, because we are a growing population. Like yeah, yeah. but basically if you look at the age, I, I don't really want to go further into it. We can also talk about it after, but if you, talk, if you look at the age structure in like uh, low-income countries, you can see that it looks a bit, a bit like this. So there are a lot of people, a lot of very young children, not a lot of young adults. And if you look at more developing countries, it looks more and more like this. So about a similar size. So we can make a lot of make some assumptions based on the fact that, you know, in 1850, people the global population structure was probably more similar to that of low-income countries, and you can uh, move on from that. Uh, and also assume that the uh, body mass is similar to the body mass in uh, low-income countries. 
So if you want, I'll be happy to show you the supplementary uh, figure after. Sure, uh, I, can, yeah. I, I can still imagine that given these arguments, it won't be like if we accept it, the difference will not be more than like 15 to 15 plus or minus. And that's fine. Yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's actually really good intuition, right? It makes sense. We, we can go back. We can't imagine that going back 170 years in time, the average person would be 10 times smaller than the average person today. Like it, they were not five kilograms, even though that would be adorable, but it's not their reality. So uh, we talked about humans for a second, and I do want to complete the full, the full picture here. And I want to say we don't have enough time to go into each one of these groups. Uh, we talked about humans for a second. There is a problem in the presentation. Apologies, this should be livestock. Obviously, we're, we're not a cow. <laughs> um, but I do want to focus on one specific group. So before I do, I will tell you that for humans, we have relatively abundant global population data. No, no one here finds it, probably, finds it probably surprising, right? We know these curves of a growing population. We also know relatively well the abundance of livestock. Going back to 1950, we have data from the UN. Going back even further in time, we have model data that is like very, very robust uh, from uh, uh, previous uh, exploitation, uh, previous uh, uh, works from uh, the high database. Um, for wild land mammals, we're able to provide this very provisional estimate based on a literature survey. I'm not going to go into that today because it's not very interesting, but if you're interested, let's talk about it later. And what I do want to talk about is marine mammals. So for marine mammals, we use the population dynamics model. And uh, we're going to spend, let's see how I am with time, like a few minutes talking about that model. OK? So let's talk about marine mammals for a second. And then for the results, we can kind of uh, combine the four groups together again. So just, uh, just as a reminder, not every species has a, a Central Bureau of Statistics. That's why we need a population dynamics model. Thank you for smiling this time around. I very much appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so again, we got the chance to use the model again. So <clears throat> of course, each one of, this, uh, of uh, these four groups has its own story, right? Humans with. Uh, We've been uh, great with medicine. We've been great with so many things. It kind of allowed us to grow uh, in, the, in the way that we did. But we have to remind ourselves that humans and marine mammals have a complicated history. Uh, if you haven't uh, seen this picture before, it's uh, from Moby Dick. It's an illustration of Mo Moby Dick. Um, and I think for me, when I, if I had to think about uh, industrial whaling or whaling, or hunting of mammals uh, before, before I started working on this project, I kind of had this image in mind, something that people did very long ago. They were not greatly efficient at it. They had to like chase this whale for a very long time before they caught it. And then, no uh, spoilers, but uh, it didn't go very well. Um, so, so this is what I have had in mind. Did anyone have anything different in mind when they think about whaling? So we can definitely think about other types of impact that we had on uh, the marine environment. And that would be a very viable and very important thing to think about. Fishing. But specifically, when, I, when we talk about whaling. So, so yeah, so they, they kind of uh, whales were just uh, natural resources, the uh, resource they were used for a lot of uh, their co components, uh, mainly for their blubber, also for their meat, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a story about whaling, it's just a, a like it, it's an interesting story. And to me, uh, it was surprising to find that it was like this huge industry not that long ago, over the past 170 years, people were uh, hunting whales, and they were doing it very, very efficiently. So it's not just uh, like these uh, wooden boats that I had in my mind. Uh, they were these whole industries of uh, people that were going to hunt whales. And since there were these whole industries, first of all, it had a huge impact. And second of all, 
There were also relatively robust data collected along the way because of uh, global political reasons that I will not get into here, but it's uh, this completely other interesting story. So I can see that I'm missing a slide here. Okay, so I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, do it without the slide. So basically the, our approach is to say, okay, we don't know uh, how many whales there were at every point throughout history over the past 170 years. But we do know something else. We know how many whales were caught every year. So let's, let's go over uh, like the whole, uh, uh, like uh, all marine mammals combined for a second. Let's think about blue whales, just as a, an exemplary species that uh, most people uh, have in, in their mind, like we know, we know of them. And we know in each year how many whales approximately were caught. So what we do is we use this model to try and estimate from the data on how many whales were caught, how many whales were there before the hunting began. Is that somewhat clear? Yeah. I imagine you need to account for the efficiency, like improved efficiency of, of catching whales. Even so, though maybe it goes down, you get better at catching them. So uh, what you're saying is that we, can, uh, we have to take into account the fact that from year to year, possibly the catch grew or like the catch uh, to abundance ratio grew because of uh, the, the fact that people were able to do it more efficiently. Skill. And you're completely right. I just don't have to do it myself. There are records of whales caught. So I know for the year 1850, how many blue whales were caught, 1851, 1852. For every year, I know how many blue whales were caught. And of course, there is some uncertainty in the reporting that we have to take into account. But just for, to simplify things, let's, let's, let's go of the uncertainty for a second and focus on the fact that we do know that. Yeah, but, that, but if, you want to extrapolate how many, if you want to extrapolate how many whales there are, you can't. Okay, so I, I can see w what I did uh, to, uh, um, um, yeah, to uh, confuse you. I will say we know how many whales there are. Do you remember from previous work? We do have an estimate for wild marine mammals. What I want to do is ask how much were there? Yeah. in 1850. So basically in very broad terms, I will say if I know how many species were there at time point 2020 or 1950, just to go back to the times where people were whaling, in the year 18, uh, in the year 1949, there were the same amount of whales as last year, minus the amount of whales that were caught during this year, plus some sort of a natural growth factor. So there's still like a birth minus death, the natural uh, thing that's going on in, uh, in the population. Is that kind of clear? You had a question? You had a question, yeah. When you use a model and try to ponder for each of these memory and that's the basic thing, how do you Yeah. So, so you uh, just uh, okay. Let me let me repeat the question to make sure that I understand it. You're asking if I need to readjust the model for each species, or I can just like put in each species one by the other and ask the model what will come out of it in the end, right? So that's a great question. One of the reasons we use this type of analysis it's because is because this is a high throughput analysis. It allows us to put in one uh, species by the other and get in the result at the end of the, uh, the day. We do have to uh, uh, use some parameters to adjust for some of these, uh, for some of the um, variations between species. So like how people know uh, blue whales very, very well. They've been counting them for a long time. So I have this uh, specific uh, amount of uncertainty that's associated with blue whales. For other species that are probably not as well monitored, I have to take into account probably a bit more uncertainty. But it's not uh, that I do it manually every time. I like use parameters to give the model so that the model can take it into account. Yeah. Can you 
So, so you're asking how can I go back in time given the uh, number of whales caught each year? Yeah. yeah. So I didn't really want to go into the equations. Do it for a second. Basically, we have this equation that is trying to describe the trajectory in time of the of how the population looked like. So n would be the size of the population. R would be some sort of a production rate, so the, the number of natural births minus the number of natural deaths. And C would be uh, the number of whales caught at the year T. And basically what I'm doing, we, we can look at it as I'm reconstructing the population as I go back in time. Or the second thing I can do is I can kind of guess where I started, so what was the population size in the year 1850, and then I can see how this has changed over time, and if it brings me to a result that makes sense, then I can say, okay, this, this makes sense. And wh what would it mean, that a, a result that makes sense? So let's say I guessed that the global population was 1 billion in the year 1850, and then every year I decreased the number of uh, whales that were caught that year, plus, you know, the the natural uh, growth, and then I got to the point where now the population is 900 million. But I know the population is not 900 million because I know the population now. So it kind of allows me to do that. It, it's kind of a, like a, yeah, I don't, I don't really want to go much further into it. I can just show you uh, kind of what the, the output of the model is like for a, simple, uh, for a single population. So this is the humpback whale in the southern hemisphere. And we have here these bars. Are, they correspond to this axis. This is the annual catch, or the number of whales that were caught in this year. And then we can build from that this kind of estimated population trajectory, where the blue dots here are abundance estimates. So we know how many whales were there in these years, sometime between 80, 1980 and uh, 2000, and then we're able to use all of that data to reconstruct the population trajectory. And we'll say, this is a very cool idea. We didn't come up with this idea. We implemented it now uh, for whales and also updated the data. But this is a, a very cool work by someone called Christensen in the year 2006. We updated the data from uh, 2000 to 2020. Uh, we should give them their proper respect. Uh, but this is an output model generated by us. A model output generated by us. Can you, yeah. explain, can you explain the waves that we observe in the ca annual catch and how you actually implemented them in your model? So my model doesn't ask about the waves. My model just gets an, as an input uh, like every, um, every year, the, the catch in every it. year. Uh, I, I can uh, make a few assumptions here and talk about the fact that, you know, in the year we all know what happened in the 40s and uh, things that happened since then. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we try, like I, I try not to uh, go too much into that. It also looks differently for different populations in different geographical regions. So this is just one specific example. But um, it looks like, uh, the, like the annual test is almost zero since the 60s. But yeah. still the population isn't uh, recovering. Yeah, so, um, so we have to take into account that uh, whales, they're, you know, they're these very large bodied mammals. They, they have a, a relatively long life. They take a lot of time to uh, reach the age where they're further enough to, so it's this uh, complicated, uh, complicated species in the sense that, you know, if we think about bacteria, we're used to the fact that like, you disturb them and they go back to their, uh, to their original uh, OD or whatever it was, um, and yeah, so uh, they take a long they take a longer time to recover. We do have an estimate that says like a moderate recovery, whatever. Um, but uh, not all species display uh, this magnificent recovery uh, that that one could expect from a, like a stopping whaling at some point. Other questions before I move on? Yeah, so it's uh, like the confidence interval and then the median estimate. So the blue one is the median estimate. Yeah, I, I didn't really say so, thank you. 
Okay, so now we can uh, zoom back out and talk about what happens when we sum all of these trajectories combined. So what happens when you sum all of the biomass of wild marine mammals at each time point over the past uh, 170 years? So we can see here that uh, you know, the blue whale used to be, what was the biomass of the blue whale in 1850? Anyone has a number? Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it, was, it was just to make sure that the, that the plot is uh, well understood. Um, so it, we still have blue whales. They're just not very abundant. We only have a few tens of thousands of uh, blue whales on this planet now. And we used to have uh, about, like the, in terms of biomass, the biomass of humpback whales and blue whales combined were about the same as what we have now in, for all uh, wild marine mammals. So uh, this is kind of the breakdown that we have. And we can also see here what happened when we stopped commercial whaling, uh, commercial uh, whaling ban uh, by the International Whaling Committee starting in, 18, uh, sorry, in 1986, which is later than uh, what uh, you can imagine if you were born uh, in the 90s or after the 90s. So um, yeah. Does anyone have a question or? Uh, there, there, there is a lot of different things. Um, that's like, uh, I, I would advise you to look it up. Like it's not, I don't really, yeah. But um, maybe just uh, prepare your uh, mental uh, stability before you look it up and uh, block all the images. Okay, so for the, the final question of this, uh, uh, of this presentation, I want to ask you, what was the wild fraction within mammal biomass? in 1850. So before I showed you this uh, beautiful uh, image of the person holding the holding animals, um, and we know that now the wild fraction is about 6%. And the question is, what was it like when you know, my great, great, whatever grandma was born in 1850? Uh, was it 80, 50, 20, or 10%? So final question, let's do it by show of hands. Is it 80%? Three, four, eighty percent. How about fifty percent? About wow, a lot of people for fifty percent. Twenty percent. More people for twenty percent. Ten. No. Fifty. I'm just giving you a second because I can see people are still looking. So. Uh, Wild. So, so it's more like 50. It's more like 50 if we compare like the total biomass of uh, you know us along with our domesticated mammals, and uh, to the biomass of uh, wild land and marine mammals combined, it was about the same uh, in the year 1850. And uh, I can say more, but I think uh, I hope this uh, image speaks for itself. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is still very much a work in progress. So if you're interested in talking more about it, reading the manuscript, getting the, the real image and not the picture of the presentation, feel free to ask. I'll be more than happy to share. Um, if anyone has any questions at this point. And if you don't, I just want to say that a lot of people were involved in the, like, uh, the, making, of, uh, the making of this work. So, uh, one is my advisor, and also Elad, and uh, Eyal, and a lot of other people. And we also have collaborators, uh, Shai Meri from uh, Tel Aviv University, and Uri Wall from Ben Gurion University, very nice people. If you want to go into these. Uh... Uh, can you go there? Yeah. It looks like the mammal that you have is a Yeah, I was surprised I didn't get this uh, question before. So thank you for asking. It looks like the wild land biomass hardly changes. So maybe you would expect it to be something completely massive in 1850. I will say that we have a very uh, rough provisional estimate for the global biomass of wild land mammals. It's very hard because the dynamics on land have been complex for tens of thousands of years between you know, uh, T1 
people and uh, wild land mammals. So this estimate is based on, based on a literature survey centered around uh, large bodied herbivores, which we suspect to be uh, uh, the most significant biomass contributors. It does change it's by about a factor of two. It's just hard to see because it's relatively small. Uh, and this is mostly due to the contribution of, uh, or lack of contribution of uh, elephants. So uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, work centered around uh, like elephants and the ivory trade and how the elephants, uh, how the biomass of elephants has decreased over time. Um, yeah. <coughs> Yeah. Um, so you would expect uh, you would expect them to like uh, maybe like the biomass of horses to like grow and then decline at some point. Uh, it kind of does based on our estimate. It's not as significant as you would expect. It's definitely not as significant as you know uh, the contribution of uh, cattle these days or anything else. Um, there, there is some sort of not all species grow in like the same way uh, when it comes to domesticated mammals over that 170 years. Horses are a bit different. It's not something uh, like uh, dramatical, maybe like a factor of two in each direction. So I'll go back to the thank yous. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for, uh, for your time. Thank you for listening. Really, if you have like any questions or anything you want to discuss. So <laughs> I was getting there. Um, so this QR, it's, uh, if, you, if you want to email me, you can just scan this QR. If you want to talk about it, I was just going to say that really like this is very much a work in progress. If anyone has like ideas, they want to read the manuscript, anything else, I'll be more than excited to do that. And uh, thank you for your time. And uh, before we finish in a, like a course uh, related note, this week is a assignment uh, free week. Next week you will get uh, another assignment. Thank you. Thank you.